which is a division of Straight. Welcome, Tanya. Very much, Ian. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a real honor to be here today. I remember last year I was sitting here in the front row as a, as a blockchain virgin, and, um, and it's, it's a real pri privilege to be standing up here to talk today. So thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I always uh, start my presentation just to create a little bit of context about who Straight is and what we do. So for those of you who don't know, Straight is what is called the Central Securities Depository. Essentially, we keep in track of who owns what shares on the stock exchange as a central database, and we transfer the shares between the buyer and the seller every day in exchange for, for cash. We are a highly regulated entity, so we get a license from the Financial Services Board, and we are owned by the um, stock exchange and the four big banks in the country, and then Citibank owns a small portion of us. So for very many years, we had this tagline that we're the trusted independent party. And as you can see from our, our now old logo, uh, we had this tagline underneath that straight is the central securities depository. So we spent our lives trying to centralize stuff. Let's centralize the settlements of equities, bonds, money markets, something like unit trusts. Um, we even had ideas to centralize a FICA database um, and the deeds office, all sorts of stuff. So when the, the blockchain headlines broke and there was this talk of decentralization and why you no longer need the trusted third party, you can imagine that our organization woke up and said, oh, something's wrong. And, uh, and we, had, we had transformed the financial markets 20 years ago. We had taken a very paper-based environment and, and essentially digitized it. And uh, instead of sit, being like sitting ducks and saying, well, is this going to take, take over the next wave? We rather stepped in and said, how can we be the ones who can potentially drive the change uh, the next time? So, so part of this is the first thing we had to do was we had to delete uh, our tagline that we had had for very many years. Um, and we went and we went on a whole change management drive with our staff. So we decided we hired some good consultants, like every um, corporate would do, and they came in and they, we ran innovation competitions and we went on change management courses and we sent people on blockchain 101 training and we decided that we were going to do this whole cultural drive to become this innovative fintech company. And what happened? Well, in, in the words of Salim Ismail from Singularity University, the organization's immune system attacked us and it said, we're not changing. And every single time the people trying to drive the change were pushing it to say, let's become this innovative fintech company, the people in the organization put their hands up and tried to fight it. So instead of us spending 80% of our time trying to figure out what blockchain is and how it could affect us, we spent 80% of our time trying to fight the people internally within that organization to try and bring about the change. And in hindsight, what we did is we went and split the company. So we separated it into what we call CSD operations, which is essentially looking after our core business. And we created Fractal Solutions, which is this, this team on the side that is looking at the future and what FinTech is about. And in hindsight, you know, the, the team that attacked was right. They were absolutely right to attack us. We have a regulatory responsibility to the financial markets in South Africa to settle 80 billion rands worth of transactions every day. You don't want that team not focusing on what they're supposed to do. There are huge projects that are in the pipeline that affect the entire financial system at the moment. You don't want that team not looking at those projects. And they're five-year projects that the financial markets are busy implementing. And, and we are trying to get everybody on this, this blockchain bandwagon, and they resisted. And in hindsight, it was probably the wrong thing to do. And we've learned in hindsight that if you want to bring about any large-scale large change in any organization, it's very, very difficult to do it um, at that sort of level. So, so this is, uh, I'm sure people have seen this in various forms, but uh, are you too busy to innovate? And, and the answer is no thanks, we, we're too busy. What we've done here in South Africa, which, which I think a lot of people might not be aware of and we're very proud of, is that there's a group of, of the, the banks and ourselves, um, the, the stock exchanges got involved, being the JSC, and we are now up to 20 organizations, or almost up to 20 financial organizations that are getting together to say, how is this going to affect the financial markets in future? And what will be the impact? We're very fortunate that the Reserve Bank, being the Saab and the FSB, are part of this group just as observers. And we're trying to say, instead of each of us figuring out what the future looks like, let's collaborate with each other and say, how can we drive 
a future vision for South Africa as such in this space. Um, we've got some amazing work happening, particularly there's a technical stream that's analyzing uh, various technical, um, all the technologies out there related to blockchain. And um, I think that that group is making significant progress for us to share ideas around it as opposed to competing with one another. And I know that the message earlier was around collaboration, and this is really what this group is about. Um, but at the same time, this group of people, you go back into your own organizations, and they, I think some of them, and I'm, and I'm making a gross generalization, face the same same challenge that straight faces when they go back into their businesses or back into their banks, that when they are trying to encourage the, the core business to change, those people um, at the same time give resistance. Now, um, fortunately for you, I'm not going to go through this slide, but if you haven't seen, in the last two weeks or so, Gartner put out a really, really, what I think is a, is a brilliant article called The Top 10 Mistakes in Enterprise Blockchain Projects. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you, you read it. It's a real bringing people down to reality of, of what blockchain is about. And I'm not going to go through this um, because, as I said, the points are valid and you can read it in your own time. But what I want to say is I think I want to add number 11 to it. And number 11 is the politics. The politics that comes into trying to drive a, a, a mind shift and a change in an organization and in society like this is huge. If I emphasis, um, just did some research in the financial services, and they, they um, asked bankers, you know, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the blockchain industry at the moment? And I'm just going to quote here that the, the biggest resistance is the readiness of the ecosystem and the need for cooperation within banks. That is where the challenge is going to come from. And um, people can tell you that they're behind you 100%, you know, like, yeah, off you go, blockchain's great, you know, um, good luck. I can always tell that, that the chickens come home to roost. Um, in, in the last week or so, there was the article about R3 uh, having spent 59 million US dollars discovering that they don't need a blockchain. And, uh, and shame, you know, in all fairness to them, they've never ever said that they needed a blockchain. They've always said they needed DLT, and it's good to go and read the, the response from them. But I probably got that email and that story from about 10 people who just, like, lapped it up. They just loved the headline because of the negativity associated with it. And two days later, uh, ING and SockGen issued a press release to say that they'd done a, a live uh, crude oil trade on a blockchain, and nobody sent me that story. So, uh, so it just shows that, that you know, the, the, I don't want to say people's true colors, but, but really the, the change that's required within an organization is the thing that I think our industry is going to most grapple with um, in, in the environment that we're in. All right, so what I've done is, um, is I've put together four key themes about what I think is emerging, because I think that we are spending too much time, particularly in the media and even amongst ourselves, debating the issues of blockchain, distributed ledger, you know, how do we reach consensus, etc. And I'm saying what's, what's happening is that there's, there's a foundational technology that's emerging, and it's going to end up being a fruit salad of different things, and everybody has their, their place in the sun as such. There's no one answer or one, one um, solution that fits all. And I've come up with four key themes. They do overlap each other, and there might be you know, use cases that don't necessarily fit strictly into a box. But I say that, that there's a theme of the purists. Um, we have the, the private permission groups. We've got the cherry pickers, and we've got the dreamers. And I'm going to unpack some of these in a bit more detail. So first of all, we've got the purists, and these are the, the advocates of, of pure blockchain and, and Bitcoin. And it speaks so nicely to Andreas's talk this morning um, as to where, do, where does this group of people fit in. And this group of people fits into the areas where the players don't know each other, they don't trust each other. It has huge potential to combat things like, like fraud, corruption, um, and in a very decentralized classical blockchain model. I would say that... 95, and I'm taking a wild guess, of the work that's going on right now in the blockchain space is not blockchain projects. They're not. We're calling them that, and I'm using that term today as a generic term to describe it, but the purists are very, very critical of the work that is going on in other areas about them not being blockchains, and they're absolutely right. They're not blockchain projects. And, uh, you know, I saw one headline that said, uh, uh, why centralized blockchain projects are doomed to fail. That's correct. That headline is correct. They are, they are doomed to fail. There's no point in building a, a centralized database on a blockchain necessarily. So, so this is the model that the, that the purists are out there, and there's definitely a place for them um, in this space. 
And then you've got the private and the permission groups. So this would be the likes of an R3, or even, um, to a large extent, our organization, some of the projects that we're working on. And what this group of people is doing is this is a mind shift for them. This is a very, very different way of thinking. Banks have never shared data in any meaningful way before with each other. They have, um, you know, they've never ever been a, a massive effort to, um, let's say, deal with corruption or fraud or, or um, you know, people with, with false credit card things and things like that. This is the first time that banks are actually willing to share data with each other. And the big thing is that it's a mind shift to collaborate in a completely different way than they've ever, ever done before. And what they're doing is they're taking the principles of blockchain. I heard today it's blockchain inspired. They're taking the principles of blockchain and they're applying that to the businesses that they are in. And it's very, very difficult to implement a purist model in a highly regulated environment. But if you're sitting in a regulated environment, such as a bank, sometimes the, this uh, closed permission network is the thing that you need. And, and when there's billions of rands moving around a system, it's sometimes what other people want. They don't necessarily want an untrusted environment um, where where it's a free-for-all and you, you rely necessarily just on technology to secure it. So I strongly believe that there is a place for these permission networks. And no, they're not blockchains, but, but they, it's a new way of them doing business and there is a place for it. Uh, the next one we've got is the cherry pickers. And uh, this group of people are taking elements of of blockchain and what it promise, promises, and they apply that to their businesses. You know, there, there's um, an unlikely friendship or partnership that's emerged recently where uh, Bosch Appliances, uh, Cisco Systems, Bank of New York Mellon have joined a consortium. And you would think like, why somebody who makes washing machines joining a consortium with some banks on blockchain? And what they're trying to do is they're cherry picking elements of the technology particularly in this case from a security perspective, to secure applications for the Internet of Things. So this is, this is a, it's not, what we're going to see is a fruit salad of stuff emerging and coming out. And, it's, and I'm, I'm not quite sure I've got to say why you need your, your, the data of your washing machine to be secure. But, but um, the point is, is that people are going to cherry pick what they need from it. They might need the immutability. They might need the security. They might actually need you know, the pure blockchain side just from that perspective. But they're going to take and build on top of things as to what they actually require. And then uh, the last one I've got, and, and uh, it's, it's sometimes overly quoted, is the dreamers. And this is where we, we all dream about where society could go in future. And I'm going to unpack this one a little bit more. So Harvard recently put out um, uh, an article on, on blockchain, nine, I think it was in January. And like all good business schools, they've put it into a two-by-two two matrix. And what they've done is they've likened it to the internet and the growth of the internet and, um, and email and that from, from 1972 as such. And as you can see from the matrix, they've got a, a low degree of um, novelty up to a high degree and then a low level of coordination leading up to a high level of coordination. And um, I don't necessarily uh, agree with the... With, uh, the concept that the novelty around Bitcoin payments is low in novelty. I think it's quite a novel thing, the, the Bitcoin system. But the point is they've got a single use case sitting there in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, they've got the substitution um, use case where there's a, a high degree of um, coordination required with a low degree of novelty. And they're saying that other examples of this could be something like the, the adoption of a cryptocurrency um, at a, 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 to replace a fiat currency. Then you've got the localized ones, which specifically speak to those private public blockchains that I referred to. And then the exciting one is the transformational one that they've pinpointed. And the, the transformational one, they, they identify blockchain as this foundational technology, and they're saying that that block is only going to see some real traction in the next 20 to 30 years in the same way that email and the internet took so long to, to get adopted in society on a mass scale. And I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I think that there is huge, huge efforts and projects going on at the moment where people are already looking at those transformational opportunities, that we're going to see the impact of this a lot sooner than we think we will. And I know that, that we all quote Moore's Law and, um, and sometimes misquote it, but I want to use the principle around it about the exponential growth of, of technology as opposed to the number of transistors that fits into a square inch. Um, just the, the principle around Moore's Law of, of the exponential growth, that I see, think we're going to see that transformational block growing a lot faster than waiting 30 years to see some sort of um, significant change. And so how does this all happen? So um, for me, it's going to be around the convergence of technologies. If you look at what is happening at the moment, we have 
anything from drones to biotech to blockchain to big data to AI to robotics to anything that's happening around that. And if you look at the growth of all these technologies, what's happening is we're going to get to an emerging po um, emergence point where they will come together. Ten years ago, there were only less than 25% of the world's population had access to a cell phone or the internet. That figure is now sitting close to 60% or 4 billion people. Those 4 billion people are able to interact one-on-one -on -one with each other, communicate instantly one-on-one -on -one with each other, trade one-on-one -on -one with each other, and the, the society is changing so quickly and in such a way that this is not 30 years away. It's going to happen, in my view, a lot sooner. Um, I thought that when I, when I put up the Gardner hype cycle, I thought I'd be the 10th person to speak about it today, and you could all take you know, um, bets as to how many times you were going to see it. But for those people who aren't au okay with it, it really just it, um, models the, an evolution of technology as such to say as it goes through a cycle what, what actually happens and what leads to adoption. So you have this peak, and we say that we're sort of at the peak of, of, in, um, of the hype cycle at the moment around blockchain. You go through the trough, trough of disillusionment, and eventually you get to this plateau of productivity. But what, why I'm, I'm pointing this out is I want to show you what the Gartner hype cycle looked like in 2005. So this was the cycle. As you can see, it's a, a beautiful even spread. Um, if, if you were in a project management office and this was your project pipeline, it would look fantastic. You've got this beautiful spread of, uh, of technologies coming along. You can see at the time 4G was, was on the up. Um, something like voice over IP was getting to the maturity phase. But there was this gradual advancement in technology that was coming along. You fast forward 10 years. This is what the pipeline looks like at the moment. And you can see that there is a massive technology revolution that's coming along. And this isn't just about blockchain but it's about all these other things that are going to catch up at the same time. And we need to start, if blockchain is the foundation or a foundational technology, we need to start looking at where do these technologies actually intersect with each other and how can we build on them. And, um, and to me, it's a very, very exciting time to be in this space. If, you just, if you're just focusing on the blockchain block as such, you need to just open your eyes a little bit wider and say what else is going to be impacted by this potentially in the future. So I know that uh, the, the medical use case is, uh, is um, uh, very often an overly cited example of what we could do with a blockchain. And fundamentally, the, the blockchain talks to the use of uh, patients' medical records. You know, we could use it for, to help that identify a patient. We can use public and private keys to give doctors access to our records. Um, it could be storing or, or giving access to, I should not say storing, giving access to our blood results and our x-rays and etc. But the administration and things that go around what happens in the, in the healthcare industry at the moment is just unbelievable. They say that you spend more time filling in admin where, than you actually spend face-to-face -face seeing a doctor when you go to hospital. Unless, obviously, you've knocked out with an anesthetic, then they might spend a bit more time with you. But you're actually spending more time filling in paperwork. There is su such a huge lack of interoperability between healthcare management systems at the moment that there are 20 different ways that your date of birth can be captured on a system. So none of these systems are actually talking to each other at the moment. And this is where we've, we've heard about that blockchain can come in. But I want to take it one step further with those conversions with technology and say, what about the other technologies that are coming along? We're walking around with sensors on our arms that's collecting data all the time about our heartbeat and how many steps we've taken. Blockchain provides data. Artificial intelligence loves data. It can be using a lot of that sort of data that's coming out of it to be conducting medical trials, to, make, to be developing and designing new sort of drugs. Um, there's, there could be some automation around the payment mechanisms of processing claims. Uh, doctors could be paid in a cryptocurrency or, or, or um, if, you know, even in a fiat currency using this. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. There's, there's also these big issues, particularly with central databases, keeping patients' records from an anti-competitive or antitrust perspective. This could provide an opportunity for those organizations to be rather using blockchain technology that they're not sitting with that, with that power that could potentially be abused. Um, and there's, there's all sorts of things that go into this space. So I want to say, you know, the potential for blockchain as a foundational technology is huge, and that's what we need to start building on um, as, as um, proponents in the industry. Um, this, this slide also came out of a clearinghouse to say, where does DLT fit into the financial services sector? And you can see that things like robotics, the banks are looking at in a, in a significant way, um, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, cloud computing. And here we can start creating credit models around by combining artificial intelligence with the data, with the blockchains, to look at different sort of credit models. Um, 
authenticating biometric information for our clients, um, automating marketplaces, the use of smart contracts. Really, the, the world is endless when you start to combine these technologies together. So, I can't decide if I've spoken really quickly or I think I might have. Yes, I've spoken really quickly because I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, but, but really what I'm trying to say to people is, is think beyond the, the potential of blockchain and um, beyond the, the true purist, public-private, the cherry pickers, etc. And look at what other use cases are out there because, because you need to look at where these other technologies are going to converge with, or with, with blockchain. And the thing is, this is a foundational technology that has the ability to support so much more out in the industry. Um, and the last thing is don't forget about the immune system and the politics because it will attack you at some stage. So, thank you. Fantastic, very well articulated, and so quick that the sound guys only come back to get the <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So I'll do this without the mic for the moment. Um, questions? Anything you want to add that you didn't know, that you thought you didn't have time for? No, no, here's a question. Great, there we go. Give us some examples of the work Straits doing. Sure, so uh, the question is, what are the examples of the work that Straits doing? So um, we, we currently, probably our most active use case that we're looking at is around proxy voting. So at the moment, um, the, we've designed a proof of concept of that, like everybody did in 2016. We did one of those and we were able to demonstrate it um, out to the market. And now we're wanting to take that concept to, into production. So that's around how do you vote at an annual general meeting um, for any listed entity. Then there's, um, there's obviously a lot of opportunity to look at uh, you know, new exchanges or new exchange models and how that can, can work, and we, we identify some of those. Uh, we were also, because we got into the blockchain space quite early on, we were approached by um, quite d diverse people. So at one stage, there was a, um, a big international donor into Africa that was looking as to how could they implement a blockchain to track donor money, um, particularly in Nigeria. Um, and as you can imagine, they, I think they, they recorded that's a huge, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, the percentage of money lost through to fraud and corruption, donor money that's lost. And they wanted to, ab to be able to use blockchain technology for that. And um, Straits actually put together a, a use case for them. We built a demo on Ethereum for them. Uh, and it's just not our core business. So we, we handed it to them and, and wished them well, essentially, um, for what they were doing. So that was, um, from, from my perspective, I was a bit devastated, but um, I suppose I need to focus on the financial services. Uh, and then we've been approached by some very interesting sort of cr crowdfunding or, or um, type of things that we're looking at. So there's, there's various use cases out there. But one of the key things which I think we're really trying to focus on is what is the long term, what, is, what, what does this industry look like in the long term? And I don't think anybody knows the answer to that yet. So we stay up to date with what's happening internationally, but we, don't quite, we haven't quite figured that one out. Great. Any more questions? There we go. Adrian. Um, have you considered um, pitching a blockchain-based solution to replace the SASA payouts? To replace the? SASA payouts. Feels to me like an ideal use case. I mean, if, if you if you want to track transparency transparency of disbursements of money, um, that's something that the I'll take the idea. Thanks, con Adrian. Consortium should should be looking at. Okay, thank you. We'll add it to our list. I think it was a rhetorical question. <laughs> yes. but, uh, uh, right at the back. This one. Hi, sorry. I just wondered how many people are working within the, the Frank's Hall the solutions part of the group. Okay, so, so we wax and wane based on how much money the board's willing to give us. Um, and uh, so at the moment, we've got a team of about five or six people, um, and it's a very fluid team. So we've, we've had some people in um, that were driving, particularly from a project management pers uh, perspective, some of the work that we were doing last year. Um, and, and this year, we've, we've changed tactic, um, and we make use of a lot of consultants um, also. So it's, but at the moment, we, we've sort of ranged between five and six staff members. Great. Any more questions? Tanya, thank you. Thank That's you. That's great. Very, very well. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll slow down, Nick. <laughs>